going to help us do it. Um, because the crisis that California is facing right now, the implications of what this recall would mean, Plato actually talked about how we got here 2,400 years ago. Uh, because in his Republic, which was uh, written after Athens had destroyed itself through the same kind of series of mistakes that the United States has made over the recent decades. Plato wrote this magnificent work which addressed, sort of clinically analyzed, first of all, what caused the, what, what, what the process of collapse of Athens was, uh, and then identified, at least in its characteristic sense, what the solution was uh, and what the solution is. Uh, I think it's absent, as, as I was reading Lynn's piece on visualizing the complex domain a couple of months ago, I kept getting drawn back to memories of what was in Plato's Republic as uh, incredibly parallel to each other. And what I'm going to do is, is look at uh, Lynn's discussion of visualizing the complex dom domain from the standpoint of how Plato actually addresses the solution to the crisis of a civilization. But first, I want to look at how California and the United States got to where it is from the standpoint of something Plato develops uh, in Book 8 of the Republic. Because for those of you who've read it, you probably remember there comes a point when he describes the degeneration of society. He describes various kinds of societies and how one leads to another. Uh, the last two degenerations that he describes in the society is the de degeneration from a democracy and really a mob democracy as he describes it into a tyranny because you and, and this is something which hit at which which Athens was engulfed by uh, they got to a point where you basically had mob democracy which was of course being manipulated from the outside uh, and the collapse of Athens then led to a tyranny coming in and taking over. Now look at, the, look, at, look at this recall. I mean, look at the question of, you know, this referendum procedure in California. You know, anybody can go out there, especially with a lot of money, and address the mob psychology of a population. I mean, how did they get the signatures for this recall petition? I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it any longer. You know, no content, or a little, perhaps a little bit of contact. I don't want to pay a car tax. Gray Davis is, you know, increasing the taxes on cars. It's all about my money, and I'm not happy because people are taking my money away from me, and I don't have enough money, and I'm just going to be mad at the nearest object of hatred you can give me. So, you know, the Cheney gang goes out and says, it's Gray Davis. Let's be mad at Gray Davis. So you have this phenomenon of this referendum where just whipping up a population on the basis of you know, pure emotion, no thought whatsoever, emotion largely connected to money, of course. Uh, you get a ref you got this, this crazy referendum, which now presents you with the possibility that were the referendum to win, you could end up with a governor elected by 10 or 15% of the vote. More to the point, you could end up with Arnold Schwarzenegger whom we've identified is a tool and a creature of some of the most powerful financial forces that exist in the world. Jacob Rothschild, Warren Buffett, and so on. I mean, this guy ain't no man of the people. Uh, he, he's, and, you know, and he's also not just some ego-driven guy, as we've discussed. He, is the, he was the preferred candidate of this financial elite. Were he to become governor with really no mandate, 10 to 15 to 20 percent of the vote, uh, but backed by these powerful financial interests, with three more years to serve in this term with no check on him, you know, you would have gone from mob democracy to a kind of tyranny very, very quickly. Uh, you know, Bustamante is just, you know, a slightly less bizarro version uh, of the same thing. I mean, you can have Hitler and you can have Mussolini, but it's still fascism. Uh, but so that final degeneration where you go from, mo from mob democracy where people are making their decisions on the basis of pure emotion and pure greed leads to the kind of anarchy which is often superseded by a tyranny. In fact, this is what we've talked about in terms of how the global financial elite has often imposed their tyrannies. 
the original synarchist movement that LaRouche has talked about was in France. What did they do? France was the country which could have reproduced the American Revolution. The European financial elite didn't want that to happen, and so they had to wreck France. How did they do it? First, they had the Jacobin Terror, anarchy, mob violence, cutting off the heads of the best people in France. What was the antidote to the anarchy? A dictatorship, Napoleon. People were so shattered by the chaos of the years of the terror, they happily embraced a dictator. Anarchy, which means without government. Synarchy, which means with government, but I mean with government, with a lot of government, called a dictatorship. But Plato actually talks about this as the final degeneration of a society. Now, what he describes is, first of all, he has one, two, three, four, five forms of society. Democracy and tyranny are on the bottom. That's the final degeneration. Above democracy, he's got oligarchy, which means rule of the few. Above that, he's got what he calls a timocracy, which is a society based on honor, tradition, so on. Timocracy means honor. And then what he describes at the top, he uses the term aristocracy. I'm not going to use it because it's got the wrong connotation for us today. Aristocracy simply means the rule of the best. But in modern European society, that's not what an aristocracy is. You know, an aristocracy is Lord Jacob Rothschild or something like that. I'm just going to call it a republic. A republic which is based on the rule of reason. Now, and he describes the degenerate, if you don't have this, and you start with this, he describes the degeneration of this into this into this into this. Now, if you look at the United States in the post-war period, you can get a kind of idea of how this might actually work. Because you look at the United States coming out of World War II. Because of Roosevelt, we'd become the strongest nation in the world, the strongest industrial power in the world. We, we were the integral force in defeating fascism in the world. Were it not for the United States and the arsenal of democracy, Hitler and the Japanese perhaps would have been ultimately defeated, but civilization could have been wrecked in the process if the war had gone on much longer. And you had an American population which came out of World War II with a certain sense of, with, with a sense of pride in having done this, uh, and a certain sense of traditional values. Uh, progress was good. You did think about the future. Um, you know, you could even see it in the advertising slogans of the 1950s and 60s. Uh, progress is our most important product. I mean, who would try and sell you anything on the basis of that today? Um, you know, Ford has a better idea. You know, who would even, you know, think about a better idea being a good thing? Um, you know, there was cert again, there were certain traditional values. People did think about the future. You know, education. It was almost, you know, a slam dunk. If you went into a community and asked for a tax increase for better schools, you got it. I mean, these were never voted down. You know, even in poor communities, because people wanted to give their children and their grandchildren a better future. So you had a certain traditional set of values, which were, the, the society was relatively functional. But the problem was, this wasn't alone. We weren't, we weren't in a vacuum. The fascists that we had fought World War II against, their German and Japanese instruments were defeated. But the Anglo-Dutch central banking interests, which had created fascism, were still there. Uh, had Roosevelt lived, they could have been wiped out uh, by Roosevelt's conception of the post-war world. Roosevelt died, and instead they were able to, sort of like fungus in the cellar, you know, continue to exist and exert more and more influence, especially over Harry Truman, uh, and carry out real atrocities like the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and the McCarthy period in the United States and so on. But as long as you had a strong leader who would come in and kind of straighten things out again. You know, Eisenhower, who had his problems but hated this synarchist fascist faction and stood up to it, 
Kennedy who would have revived the American system and Franklin Roosevelt's policies, as long as you had a leader somewhere on the horizon. Uh, you know, we got along okay under these traditional values. And I would say that basically we were functioning like a democracy. People weren't conscious of why they thought these things, but they just thought good things. You know, that, that these were the, this is the way your society should operate. But we came under attack by the synarchists. And as LaRouche has identified, in the 19, especially in the 1960s with the Cuban Missile Crisis, the assassination of Kennedy, then the war in Indochina, these were deliberate acts of terror being carried out by this Anglo-Dutch banking faction, this synarchist faction, to terrorize especially the baby boomer generation into submission. And, uh, and terrorize the older generation as well. So under the, th this kind of attack, people gave up. Either the older World War II generation just got pessimistic and demoralized, or the baby boomer generation, which really never, never grew to adulthood with this set of values, got, got these, these, value, these traditional values were essentially shattered. Uh, and you ended up with a baby boomer generation which said, you know, if it feels good, do it, uh, and, and began to make decisions from the standpoint of uh, if it feels good, do it. Uh, and what was the result of that? By 1971, you, you had this, what we could call, what I'm calling in this pur for these purposes a democracy, a society based on certain traditional values, but no real consciousness of why these were good values, you had it replaced by an oligarchy, because what happened in 1971? While people weren't really paying a whole lot of attention because they were really getting into the consumer society, and you know, after all, you know, there was probably a World Series going on or something like that, you know, people's emotions more and more got involved in their personal lives and so on. Well, nobody was noticing except Linda LaRouche, Richard Nixon ended the Bretton Woods financial system, which was the financial system which protected sovereign nations from this financial oligarchy. As long as we had a fixed currency, as long as we had protectionism, as long as we had these other kinds of policies, under those circumstances we could protect our economy and unthinking people could go on with their traditional lives and their traditional values and so on. But because those unthinking people weren't paying attention, you had this breaking of our protection, uh, our economic protections, and the financial elite took over. So since 1971, uh, the world has been increasingly under the grip of the International Monetary Fund, the Federal Reserve, derivatives, private financial interests, and so on. And so a financial oligarchy, a few, really are the people who have been making the decisions in the United States for most of the past 30 years. We're reaching the end of that kind of financial system, and the synarchists, the, the fascists, uh, seeing now that people are getting very angry about the collapse of this, you know, have whipped up the mob democracy as you see in California. Why is California bankrupt? Because we're in a depression brought about by 30 years of bad policy, irrational policy, and because Dick Cheney's friends at Enron, Dynegy, Reliant, and so on came in and stole tens of billions of dollars of California. But people simply being whipped up into an angry mob are ready to usher in essentially a tyranny. So I'm not sure that's exactly the way Plato would have described it, but it gives you an idea of how a not so bad society begins to degenerate further and further downward. Now what does Plato identify as uh, the society which actually works? <coughs> He, he identifies it, he calls it, as I say, an aristocracy, which is simply the rule of the best, uh, the people who have taken responsibility for knowing the way the universe works. But as I say, I'm going to call it a republic. Now, when Plato begins to discuss uh, this, right before he actually goes through a whole elaborate discussion, which is basically the last three books of Plato's Republic, 8, 9, and 10, he actually gives a, a so-called definition of what would go into the society that actually works. 
Now, I'm going to read this to you, and I want you to, I want you to strap on your seatbelts. And um, because this is, and, and, you know, just listen to what he says and uh, react however you feel like you want to react, all right? He says, um, for this society, you actually have to have men and women who are marrying at the right time. Uh, so that they will beget children at the right time of the year. Uh, and he says there's actually a number which will help us do this, will help us understand when men and women should get married and when they should beget children and so on. All right, you ready? Hang on. Uh, he says, now for mortals, the number uh, is that in which augmentations dominating and dominated when they have attained to three distances and four limits of the assimilating and the dissimilating, the waxing and the waning, render all things conversable and commensurable with one another, whereof a basal four-thirds wedded to the pen pad yields two harmonies at the third augmentation, the one the product of equal factors taken 100 times the other of equal length one way but oblong. One dimension of a hundred numbers determined by the rational diameters of the pen pad, lacking one in each case, or of the irrational lacking two. And the other dimension of a hundred cubes of the triad. And this entire geometrical number is determinative, determinative of this thing, of better and inferior births. Huh? <laughs> uh, it's uh, it's not just five. I think it, and it's not a pentagon. It's I think it's fiveness. I think it's the concept of fiveness. Uh, now, I think somebody should actually figure that out in terms of what what the number what the number is. But do 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 we really think that Plato is saying? Yeah. that your society is only going to function if you figure out this number <laughs> and you generate births and marriages from the standpoint of this number? I mean, do we really think that's what Plato was saying? Some people do. I mean, some people say that he's taking this literally and he means this and he's a eugenicist and he's a fascist. Other people say he's not really serious about any of this kind of stuff. Now, this isn't the first time he does something like this um, because uh, throughout there's, there's a number of these kinds of metaphors in the, uh, in the Republic. But what I would suggest instead, that this is a metaphor for the complex domain. Maybe it's more than just a metaphor. Maybe it's an actual incommensurable uh, discussion of various kinds of incommensurables. I don't know. I haven't worked it out. But I think it's a metaphor for something like the complex domain. And what Plato is actually challenging you to do is to recognize that there's a certain quality of thinking which is crucial if you're going to have a successfully functioning republic. Now, this isn't the first time he throws one of these zingers at you because, you know, for those of you who've read it, uh, especially books three and four and five of the Republic, it's a lot of fun to watch people read these books because they start bouncing off the walls, right? Because it talks about um, holding wives and children in common. Uh, it says that you can't read Homer. Uh, it says that you can't read all sorts of things and so on and so forth. And you're sitting there saying, what is this, some kind of fascist dictatorship which Plato is trying to you know, convince us? Is this his formula for a society? And as I say, some people say, yeah, it's his formula for a society. He's a fascist. Other people say, ah, he really doesn't mean any of this. You know, it's just an exercise and so on. Um, but what Plato is actually doing is he's posing, he's posing in the first part of the Republic uh, a paradox because he goes through this whole question, all these do's and don'ts in terms of what you can read, what you can do. You know, only the best can marry the best share your wives in common, you don't know who your children are, they get raised by other people, and so on. I mean, it's a pretty 
weird discussion from anybody's standpoint, probably including Greek society in 400 BC. But what Plato, is at, what Plato actually does is at a certain point in the Republic, starting in about Book 6, he actually throws a new hypothesis at you. And what he says is this. He said, um, we're, we're, we're considering how you find the most intelligent and those who understand principles to actually govern a state. And, uh, and uh, his uh, questioner, who at this point is Glaucon, says, well, in our previous argument, the first three or four books, he said, you know, we, we said we had to educate the guardians in gymnastics and music. Uh, and we were very specific, and, and the kinds of tales they could listen to and so on, we were very specific about what they could do. And what Socrates says at this point is he says, well, we were educating the guardians through habits, imparting by the melody of the music a certain harmony of spirit. But this was not science. And, you know, with riz rhythm, measure, and grace, and qualities akin to the best myths and tales that we would let them listen to. But indeed, there was no study that tended to an investigation of the good. So in the whole first three or four books, he's, um, he's talking about basically training people from the standpoint of habit. Uh, without any examination of what the underlying axioms are. And uh, what he, he then goes on to say is we sort of short-circuited what we should have been talking about. In fact, there's a number of points in the Republic where he says, you know, there's a longer way we could use to investigate this, but we're not going to go there yet. You know, let's see how far we get with this investigation, with these hypotheses. And, uh, but at this point now in the Republic, he says, um, we, we, we are saying that for the most perfect discernment of these things, uh, another longer way is requisite, which would make them plain to one who took it. Uh, but we fell short of that in our previous discussion. And uh, he says, um, such a one must go around the lo must take the longer way, and must labor no less in studies than in the exercises of the bodies, uh, or else, as we were just saying, he will never come to the end of the greatest study, and that which most properly belongs to him. And Glaucon says, "Well, aren't these things we've already been talking about, like justice and sobriety and wisdom and things and t good temperament? Aren't these the greatest things?" And Socrates says, no. Uh, is, or he says, is there something greater than justice and the other virtues we described? And Socrates says, there's not only something greater, but of these very things we need not merely contemplate an outline, but now we must discover their true essence. For you have often heard that the greatest thing to learn is the idea of the good, by reference to which just things and everything else becomes useful and beneficial. So he's basically just stopped the entire argument and said, wait a minute, we haven't actually been talking about how you know the good. You can't discover justice, you can't discover how you can actually organize a state unless you know what the good is. And um, uh, he, says, uh, that our, he says our constitution will have its perfect organization only when a guardian who knows such things oversees it. Now, if you take the first hypothesis, and for those of you who remember it, um, he start the, the hypothesis which involves this training by habits, and you can only <coughs> study certain things, and you can only be in the you can only hear tales that tell you good things about the gods. You can't hear about bad things about the gods. You can only listen to certain kinds of music because other kinds of music are going to cause you to cause your soul to be out of harmony and so on. If you actually look carefully at the first part of the dialogue, he keeps comparing people to training dogs. I mean, he basically keeps talking about, well, don't you cultivate your hounds this way? Uh, and it's really just a kind of animal-like training. Yes, it's good things. You're supposed to listen to good music and not bad music. But, you know, I think it's probably the case that if you – 
play Mozart in your house, your dog is probably going to be less psychotic than if you play something else in your house. Or it's been proven that rats actually do go psychotic, you know, if you play heavy metal rock so too long and so on. So the question of what kind of music you listen to simply from the standpoint of habit and training really isn't getting at the fundamental question. So he's introducing a second hypothesis now, which is to actually govern your society, your guardians have to actually know what the good is. And that really does pose the question of the difference between man and beast. Because really the first part of the dialogue, there's really not a lot of cognition going on in terms of this discussion of the training of people in, uh, uh, in, his, in, in the city which he is forming. Now, the difference between man and beast is of course the subject of LaRouche's piece on visualizing the complex domain. And uh, as, as he poses it in there, what evidence do we have of the uniqueness of human beings? What is it that we can demonstrate sets human beings above those nice fuzzy little dogs and those nasty cats that brought the fleas in here that we had to get rid of last night and so on and so forth? Uh, it's that the human mind can actually comprehend universal principles and understanding those principles exert greater power over actions in the physical universe. A dog or a cat cannot change its relationship to nature. You can change its relationship to nature for it, but it in and of itself cannot discover a new principle, cannot change the way it feeds itself, uh, and so on and so forth. And it's the, the, it's the existence of this capacity, which Lynn describes uh, is the ability to visualize the complex domain which sets man above the animal. Now, in describing what he means by the complex domain, I'm going to read you just a couple of quotes from, uh, from his piece and then go back to Plato and show you how Plato was discussing exactly the same kind of questions <coughs> in books six and seven of the Republic. Um, in fact, I think Plato ghost wrote part of visualizing the complex domain because the concepts that Lynn develops, obviously with the benefit of 2,400 years of further breakthroughs beyond what Plato was grappling with, but nonetheless, the basic characteristic is there. So, as some of you know, and perhaps some of you don't, Lynn differentiates between two categories of knowledge, shadow and substance. Uh, the shadows, as he describes, he says, um, what our senses report to us is at best the effect of action by the world outside of those senses, not the image of that effect, effect, efficient action, action itself. The senses show us at best shadows cast by a universe which exists beyond the direction of the senses, the direct observation of the senses. The domain of sense perception presents us the mere shadows of the real principles which operate in a universe outside the domain of direct sense perception. And one of the simplest, or simplest, one of the most obvious conceptions is the conception of gravity. It governs the fact that we're not spinning into the sun and we're not spinning out, you know, to where there won't be any sun and we'd be popsicles very quickly. I mean, gravity is a very, very important universal principle the fact that we are where we are in the solar system, which is why you can actually sustain human life, is a result of the principle, the universal principle of gravity. You can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't taste it. Yet, through the work of Kepler and others, we understand how it functions. And by understanding how it functions, we've got a capacity to, to exert power in our, in, on the Earth and as we discovered new principles, we were able to get out of the Earth's orbit, develop enough energy to break free of gravity, get into orbit, get to the moon. We should be at Mars, but we're not yet, and so on. But that's but th that is a principle. You cannot see that. Your senses cannot see that. What your senses can, what what gravity is, however, and Lynn describes it in this way, is discoveries of universal physical principle which show us principles by means of which we can increase our willful and also visible control of the universe. They also show us the nature of that universal principle of physical hypothesis, the faculty of noesis, 
by means of which we are able to adduce the existence of and affect the practical mastery of those specific physical principles. Now let's go back to Plato. And as he's now discussing this question of how are we going to educate our leaders to this principle of the good, of knowing the good, so that they can truly govern their society, he um, develops that there are two faculties that human beings have. Uh, one, as he puts it, uh, there are two entities. The one which is sovereign over the intelligible order and the one which is sovereign over the world of the eye. And he says, you surely apprehend the two types, the visible and the intelligible. Now, in Greek, this is really quite elegant and quite nice uh, because the two concepts which Linz talks about, the world of sense perception and then the world of universal principles which you can only know by your mind. <coughs> now, how many words did I just use to describe those two things? Lots of words. You could do it in Greek, Greek with two words. I gotta write it in Greek first because I get confused if I try to write it in English first. This is things which are knowable to the eyes, the senses. And these are things which are knowable to the mind. Because this is based on the verb to see, or ra'a, and this is based on the verb to know, noe'a. Now, those of you who are familiar with LaRouche's and Vernadsky's concept of the noosphere, you know, it's embedded right here. So, these two concepts, which Plato keeps coming back to over and over again, there, are, there is the oratos, which you can see with your senses, and there's the noetos, which. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> See? <laughs> You're right. I can't write both at the same time. Yes, it looked like Voet something. Anyway. Um, now, Plato says a little bit more about what it is that you see with the quality of the mind. Uh, because he uses the example of the difference between beautiful things and the idea of beauty. Uh, beautiful things are things you can see with your mind, which you define, and so on and so forth. Those are things which come into existence and go out of existence. They're becoming and they're being destroyed. You know, a beautiful <coughs> painting, a beautiful face, a beautiful flower, these things are generated and they're destroyed. The idea of beauty is, more of, is an eternal idea. It's an idea which... The idea, it, the idea of beauty is not something which is destroyed, which comes into being, and so on. So he, he is, is identifying that in, in this domain, you have the ability to look at eternal essences, you know, existences which are e eternal, obviously not tangible or physical, but these kinds of ideas. And that's an, it's a concept which you're, we'll, we'll come back to. Now... I've always been really irritated when people do classes where they read long excerpts from people, um, but I'm going to do it to you anyway, <laughs> because I, I really do want to have Plato speak for himself uh, in a dialogue with LaRouche, because it really is so extraordinary in terms of how much it's echoed uh, in this that I can't resist. So... Um, So he then goes on to develop, actually, um, he actually says, all right, now let's take these two domains. Let's take the world of the senses, and let's take the world of uh, the mind, and let's divide it. Let's draw a line, and let's divide it. What did I do with it? Oh, it hides on these little things. It goes here. Yes. He says, let's divide it. Let's draw a line. He actually says, there's a, there's a Greek word in here which is really wild because it can mean equal or unequal. So mm -hmm. you actually have to figure out from thinking the thing through whether he means divide these things equally or unequally. And he says, uh, in the world of the senses, divide it again, and you have the things which you actually see. You have objects. You see the tree. 
But you also have images. You can see a tree in a mirror. You can see a tree reflected in water. You can see a shadow of a tree, and so on. So he divides the, the, the realm of the senses from those two standpoints. Then he d d divides the other realm preliminarily. He calls it the difference between opinion and knowledge. Um, and <coughs> then he starts to examine what's going on in this domain because this is obviously the interesting domain and uh, he says um, within this, this domain of the noetos he said you have two kinds of thinking and two kinds of reasoning uh, you have one which uh, he says starts with a set of assumptions and it doesn't examine first principles. It doesn't un examine the underlying principles of these assumptions. It just takes these assumptions and it goes down to a conclusion, a rigorous conclusion from those assumptions. And he obviously uses as an example of this uh, geometry. Euclidean geometry. He doesn't say Euclidean geometry, but he says the geometers. The geometers will, you know, take certain assumptions, the parallel postulate, certain assumptions about angles, diameters, and so on. They don't examine where these assumptions came from. They simply develop uh, various, various axiomatic lattice structures on the basis of that. Uh, and uh, they, they do, they, he, he says, however, they actually are trying to figure out something eternal in the sense that they're not oper when they're operating from the standpoint of some construction with the square, they know that the construction they're working on is not the square they're actually talking about. In other words, they know when they draw a square and a diameter, it's only a representation of, a, of, a, of, of the idea of the square, the idea of the diameter. So there's a certain degree to which they're trying to get at actually real essences. But the problem, he says, is they don't examine first principles. They don't examine the ideas which underlie these, these, these assumptions. And this is what he classifies in this category. Uh, actually, he redefines it. Got to do it again. Um, which means through the reason. Uh, here's our word noia again. It's a great word. It's everywhere in Plato. Uh, just so you know the origin. Mind. That's, what, that's where this is all coming from. Cognition, mind. Not just calculation, not just understanding, but the actual mind. Um, so this is through the mind. It's not the mind itself. It's through, but it's using the mind, but it's not actually getting at first principles. Um, so, but then he says, but let's look at the more fundamental over here. And this is where he says, um, well, he counterposes again the first the first class. He says. Um, in, in the first class, the opinion de Anoia. He says, uh, the soul is compelled to employ assumptions not proceeding to a first principle uh, because of its inability to extricate itself from and rise above its assumptions. And then he goes to the second, and he says, look, understand then that by the other section of the intelligible, I mean that which the reason itself lays hold of by the power of dialectics treating its assumptions not as absolute beginnings, but literally as hypotheses, as underpinnings, footings, springboards, so to speak, to enable it to rise to that which requires no assumption and is the starting point of all. And after attaining to that, again, taking hold of the first assumptions from it so as to proceed downward to the conclusion. And here's the punchline. <laughs> 
making no use whatever of any object of sense, but only of pure ideas, moving on through ideas and ending with ideas. And that's the fact, I mean, it's one of my favorite quotes in the world, um, but that's the faculty which generates what, we, what Helga LaRouche has recently talked about in terms of Geistesmassen, thought objects. Um, well, in, in, which is just uh, a, a more, uh, this is another substantive form, form of this. You, but you could use this word for the idea of a thought object. Again, I'll read it. Read that last part again because I think it really it, it, it captures very profoundly what LaRouche is talking about in terms of this one domain. Um, so proceeding downward to the conclusion, making no use whatever of any object of sense, but only of pure ideas moving on through ideas to ideas and ending with ideas. Now, in this domain... Um, it's in this domain that you can begin to confront it, well let's put it this way between this domain and this domain uh, Plato then says alright now we get to st how, do, how do we actually do this question of ideas through ideas to pure ideas he says well we take advantage of paradoxes and again we can go back to what LaRouche says in the complex domain paper where he redefines again this question of the complex domain and he says um, the proof that the universe contains efficient universal principles which are not themselves directly objects of the senses presents us with the need to think of the individual's relationship to nature around us in terms of two geometries the first of those is what I have defined as the anti-Euclidean form of the geometry of the universal sensorium. The second is a geometry based on nothing but an experimental reading of the measurable relations within a set of interrelationships among those discoverable and experimentally validatable universal physical principles which are generated by Plato's method of hypothesis. And that section that I just read you, which I believe is the end, the very end of book six, is precisely that. And he says, the first is, approxima is approximately the shadow world geometry of sense perceptual space time. The second is the unperceived universe of those actual principles which produce those paradoxical sensory effects which prompt the recognition of the existence of the unperceived but efficiently existing universal physical principles. And then Plato goes on to discuss exactly that. But before he does it, he stops again to remind people where we are. And he once again goes back and identifies that we're now dealing with a different kind of hypothesis of how you educate people than you did before. And what he says at a certain point, he says, um, uh, one version of education is not in reality. Um, it's the education uh, which, well, as he puts it, um, you think that the soul is missing knowledge, so you try and put the knowledge in it, and through habit, through training, and so on. Uh, he said it's like trying to put vision into blind eyes. He said, I'm talking about something else. I'm talking about somebody who already has vision, and every, because he believes, it, because every soul has reason, you just have to turn it toward the good. And... Um, uh, so it's, it's no longer a question of just trying to pound something into somebody that wasn't there before but how do you edu actually educate the soul what are the forms of education it takes so that you will actually turn toward the good and he's, he has an, another very beautiful quote where he says um, the true analogy for this indwelling power in the soul and the instrument whereby each of us apprehends is like that of an eye that cannot, could not be converted to the light from the darkness except by turning the whole body. Even so, this organ of knowledge, 
must be turned around from the world of becoming, that which is created and destroyed. Uh, uh, the world of becoming together with the entire soul until the soul is able to endure the contemplation of essence and the brightest region of that which is, the, the, the ideas, the eternal ideas that exist. Uh, and he then goes back and addresses these other virtues they were talking about in the first three or four books, um, wisdom, temperance, courage, and so on. And he said, then these other so-called virtues do seem more akin to that of the bo body, for it is true that where they did not pre-exist, we could create them by habit and practice. But this excellence of thought, which we're talking about, it seems is certainly of a more divine quality, a thing that never loses its potency, but according to the direction of its conversion becomes useful and beneficial, or if it's turned in the wrong direction, useless or harmless. Um, now, he's, he's used really, and th this, by the way, is the point where you, you go into the parable of the cave, but he's all, which I'll, I'll mention in a minute, but he's already set this up with a very, very beautiful analogy. And when I went back and uh, reread Visualizing the Complex Domain, uh, where Lynn talks about the one section entitled Our Creative Sun, and he talks about the youthfully exuber exuberant sun spinning off mass to create the solar system and so on. Well, Plato has a sort of pre-echo of this um, because what he des describes, too, is a beautiful metaphor uh, of the sun and how could it be anything but a happy sun. Um, he says, uh, we have, the, we have the, the faculty of sight and we have objects that we, we, we see, but you can't see anything unless you have light. You can't see in the dark. So the sun is something which is neither vision nor that which you're seeing, but it's absolutely necessary to your ability to do that. And he says the sun is to vision and the objects of vision as the good is to your mind, which is like your sight. It's the faculty which allows you to do it and to noetos. So he's already developed this really beautiful image that you've got this fact, your mind exists as a faculty like sight. The, the objects that that faculty can comprehend, either objects of the eyes or objects of the mind are there, but you actually can't know it without the good. You have to be turned to the good. The good is like the, the good is to this process what the sun is to this process which adds an even more beautiful power to the whole image of the parable of the cave, where, as most of you know, I'm sure, um, he, he draws the metaphor of people who are, have lived only in a cave, are chained so they can only see the back wall of the cave, can't move their heads, and all they can see is the shadows cast on the wall of the cave, which are being created by light and objects behind them, but they never see the light and the objects behind them. And he describes how it would be if someone were to come out of that cave, and essentially th this is the shadow world that Lynn is talking about, the world of your senses, which is only showing you the shadows of the universal principles. How you come out of that cave, come up into the light, it, which again is the beautiful metaphor of the, you come up into the good, you seek the good, that is how your mind actually can know universal principles. Um, so uh, he, he and, and describes what it would be like uh, if someone came out into the light. In other words, somebody's mind was liberated from the world of sense perception, functioned in the world of noesis, and then had to go back down into the cave and, explain, and try and explain to people what was going on. Now, none of you know what that's like, right? <laughs> like every day when you have to go out to organize, you know, the, the eternal cry, why can't I stay here and study Gauss? Why do I have to go out there and talk to these people? <laughs> um, because, I mean, it's, it's exactly, you know, and he also describes how they would be very angry. You know, and you think of how angry people, how angry people, 
those people in the oligarchy who are trying to control world, the world by keeping people in the world of shadows and sense perception. How angry they are when Lynn keeps coming right back in, you know, and saying to people, look, there's sunlight up there. You know, you have a mind. There's good. If you turn toward the good, you're going to discover a world where you actually have some power. They get very, very angry uh, at Lynn for that. So, um, so at this point, Socrates addresses the question then, all right, what kind of studies should we actually undertake since we sort of dismissed the forms of music that he talked about earlier? He doesn't dismiss music entirely, obviously, but the, the way they were talking about it, repetition, habit, you can only listen to certain kinds of things and so on. Uh, what kind of study is going to turn the soul to the good? And what he describes is really beautiful. He uses, the exa he uses examples in the study of numbers, geometry, astronomy, and then he says, oops, we forgot solid geometry. Let's go back and look at solid geometry. And then astronomy, which provoke the paradoxes that force you to use this quality. That is, he describes there's certain things in the realm of the senses, which actually don't provoke this higher quality. Um, you know, you, as he said, you look at a finger, you see a finger, there's no <coughs> contradiction or paradox, it's a finger. But let's say you start get to the, getting to the question of number. Uh, just take the question of one. You know, what is one? Can you show me what one is? I can show you one square. I can show you one dog. I can show you one flock of geese. I can show you all sorts of things. What's one? I can show you, um, as you see in geometry, uh, I can show you a square. What did I do with it? This time I really lost it. There it is. Uh, you know, as we've all seen, if you do, uh, if you square, uh, create the di diameter in this square, and let's say we've done this construction and it's the square root of 2, but we get rid of the square. What's that length now? You know, that's a paradox. That length is defined as the square root of 2 only in the context of that particular square which it created. Or I'll give you another example. You can take the nine Democratic candidates. Um, there are one. I mean, really, in political terms. It, it was nine who were created as a unit, you know, to try and buffalo the American population. So you have the group of Democratic candidates that are accepted by the oligarchy. It's a one. So you've got nine who are a one. They're a unit. These are the candidates, so-called. Well, there's another paradox. Each one of them is a zero. <laughs> so <laughs> you add up nine zeros, and you still get a zero. So you have a one, which is a nine, and a zero. I'm not sure that's what Plato meant, but, but you get the idea uh, in terms of numbers. Um, and he says, I'm talking about things which are provocative. He said, those perceptions which have the effect I set down as provocatives when the perception no more manifests one thing than its contrary. And that forces a quality of thinking in the mind which can only be grappled with in this domain. But it is very much what Lynn is talking about in terms of the, the paradox between the sensorium and the noetic region uh, and so on. And he says... Um, uh, and he says, when it, now he says, now when I'm talking about the study of numbers, I'm not talking about the numbers used by merchants and so on uh, to buy and sell things. He said that this branch of learning should be prescribed by our law and we should induce those who are to share the highest functions of the state to enter upon the study of number and take hold of it not as amateurs, but to follow it up until they attain to the contemplation of the nature of number by pure thought not for the purpose of buying and selling, as if they were preparing to be merchants or hucksters, <coughs> uh, but for the purpose of facilitating the conversion of the soul itself from the world of generation 
to the world of essence and truth. Um, and uh, he says, uh, this is the very point at which we were speaking, that it directs the soul upward and compels it to discourse about pure numbers, never acquiesce, acquiescing if anyone proffers to it in the discussion numbers attached to visible and tangible n bodies, but rather uh, to speak of units which can only be conceived of by thought <laughs> and which it is not possible to deal with by the senses. So, uh, and, and he then goes on to generate various paradoxes around, around that. Uh, I'm going to skip some of the paradoxes he puts forward in terms of geometry and solid geometry, but it's really fun to go back and read this section from the standpoint of all the work that we're doing right now. But I can't resist the section on astronomy um, because it really, as I say, it's a pre-echo of the way Lynn discusses the uh, sensorium of the night sky and how the paradoxes derive from that. Because he says, um, well, actually, Glaucon says, oh, we study astronomy because it makes us look up, and that elevates us. Yeah. And <laughs> Plato says, not quite. <laughs> um, he says, uh, thus these sparks that paint the sky, since they are decorations on a visible surface, we must, be re we must regard to be sure as the fairest and most exact of material things. But we must recognize that they fall far short of the truth the things we see on the sensorium of the night sky. The movements, namely, of real speed and real sl slowness in true number and in all true figures, both in relation to one another and as the vehicle of the things they carry and contain. These can be apprehended only by reason and thought, not by sight. So, um, so this is a whole discussion of the complex domain, the fact that it is the paradoxes between the sensorium and these universal, pr the paradoxes provided by the sensorium, which force you to deal with universal physical principles. Now, let me return to the dialogue with Lynn, where he says, uh, therefore we must create the mental image of a new space-time which on the one hand corresponds to perception, but on the other hand moves perceived action by some knowable but imperceptible universal physical principle. The conjunction of these two actions respectively, shadow and substance, defines a new <coughs> geometry in which both effects perceived and causal are combined as one geometry. And that's, that is in reality the course of study which Plato insists that the guardians of the state must embark in. Now, it is, and it is this kind of exercise of our noetic powers which differentiates man from a beast. Uh, and Lynn concludes the, this discussion uh, from the following standpoint, and this now gets back to the question of how you make decisions which actually govern, govern your society, which is the question of Plato's Republic. And it's what Plato is grappling with, and he's laying the basis for the problems he can't solve, like problems of economy, which aren't solved for another 1,800 years or so until Nicholas of Cusa and the Great Renaissance, and the formation of the nation state, which creates the first ability to create a state in which all men are created as creatures of reason. Plato has the idea, but Greek society is not a reflection of it, <coughs> but he's laying the basis for something to unfold over the centuries. And it really does get down to the question of your definition of yourself as a creature of your senses, which is you as a mortal being, and a creature of your mind, which is what defines you as immortal. And the way Lynn puts it is, he says, in terms of governing your society, the individual has to choose between a mortal identity within the bounds of sense perception as such. But the second true sense of human individual identity locates the immortal existence of the individual, 
by name as good science r recalls the personal name of those discoverers of valid universal physical principles. In the existence of society so far, the success of any culture depends upon the contributions of the leading role of persons devoted to the second immortal sense of universal identity as guides of a people which were pulled down morally by an excessive emphasis on the less than universal, the inferior, the mortal sense of personal identity. So for all globally extended European civilization to date, exceptional persons of universal outlook, such as Solon of Ath Athens, the Socrates of Plato's dialogue, and Plato himself are typical of this. And then he g then goes on to discuss how our constitution becomes the the vehicle in which this question of immortality finally becomes embodied in the government of a state. This is the culmination of Plato's Republic. Our constitution is the fulfillment of these ideas which Plato was grappling with 2,500 years ago. And uh, what is LaRouche saying when he says we have to make California a pilot project for a return to sanity? Here's a state which is on the verge of tumbling into complete chaos and from there tyranny. And yet what he is saying and what we are doing in the organizing that we're doing, not the organizing of, quote, defeat the recall, but the organizing from the standpoint of how are we going to return sanity to the population? How are we going to reestablish this question of governing from the standpoint of the good? of educating people in such a way that they can know universal principles, they can make their decisions from the standpoint of the good. Our founding fathers did it. That's why we're a republic. We're a republic because we're supposed to adhere to universal principles. That's why I renamed Plato's first form of society from that standpoint. When we function from the standpoint of universal principles, we prosper. When we drop below the level in any way, we start this downward progression. Um, and the solution to it uh, is a return to sanity and a return to universal principles. What we have the opportunity to do in defeating this recall is defeating an enemy operation which purpose is taking us all the way to tyranny. But doing more than that, actually beginning the process of building a true republic for the first time in history, the LaRouche Youth Movement is, for the first time in history, functioning in the political domain from the standpoint of these universal principles. So we are going to take over the world, and my friend Plato is going to help. So, thank you. Yeah. Did Plato ever discuss um, this idea of republics working mutually together in, in his book? No, because there weren't any. <laughs> I mean, the idea is, again, it's a seed crystal of an idea. Uh, but because, because there were still breakthroughs to be made, um, it never really got to that point. I mean, you know, the embedded problems of Greek society, like slavery and so on. I mean, the fact of, of human beings being treated as no better than an animal was still a part of civilization at the time. Greece wasn't a slave society per se, although in its worst periods of degeneration, certainly the Spartan society was a slave society per se, but it was there, and it wasn't, it wasn't something that was solved in the domain of statecraft until you get Nicholas of Cusa and his works on the idea of the republic. So, I mean, what's beautiful about human history is you can see the progression Cusa could not have done what he did without Plato. The founding fathers couldn't have done what they did without Leibniz, Cusa, and Plato. The Plato didn't have the, was not at a historical moment in history where he could solve all of these problems, or frankly, even address them at that point. Yeah. How did the uh, idea of essentially the aristocracy change from, from what you said, or how did you know that it was a society that appertains to religion? Well, it's because that's actually the way Plato just what Plato's intention when he describes it is simply the society of the best, not from the standpoint of some hereditary bestness, but the society of the best as he's discussing educating them. 
So the Greek word aristos just means the best. So it's embedded in the word somewhere along the process of European civilization. You know, the landed oligarchy grabbed it, you know, and, and made it an artificial division in society as opposed to simply those who are taking the responsibility for discovering these ideas to govern, being the ones who should govern. Anybody figure out the nuptial number? <laughs> uh, I just, um, uh, Phil, a while back, he said that you know people have all sorts of problems. People have a problem like, like I'm for the war, I'm for Cheney. He said that's a minimal problem that people have. That's easy to overcome. But when you actually start to deal with people that say man is a beast and actually have a more deeper philosophically rooted problem, um, that's when you actually run into trouble. I was wondering if you had any specific insight on that, given this type of degeneration that you're talking about and Plato. Well, I think what, the one thing that Plato doesn't talk about, um, but it's, it's, it's sort of the, uh, the setting within which it happens, is this degeneration really doesn't happen naturally. I mean, there's bad guys out there who do this. You know, I mean, you look at what happened to the United States between the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and so on. It's not simply a natural progression. Um, it was a deliberate operation run by the enemies of this republic. So the, to the degree that you run into that, I think you want to be conscious. You want to somehow elicit out of the person the fact of, hey, buddy, you're a victim of the oligarchy. I mean, this is actually how they control you. This is how they're destroying society. This is actually their main weapon. It's not their money. It's not their nuclear mis missiles. It's not the television set. It's not public opinion. They control you with this image. And I think it's important to put it from that standpoint. Because the natural tendency of a child is to discover things, is to discover his mind is to have happiness at discovering something new. You know, there's a famous painting by a 19th century American painter named Thomas Eakins, which is this beautiful painting of about a two-year-old, I guess, I'm not very good at this, a little two-year-old kid stacking up blocks. And he captures the joy with lighting and just his, the expression on the child's face, the joy of making a new discovery. Now, zillions of children have made that discovery before, but for that child, it was the first time he had that discovery. A natural society loves that. That's when, a, that's when you, you can see inexpressible love of a parent for a child. So the more interesting question is, how does that get pounded out of society? And it, does, it certainly doesn't happen naturally <coughs> at this phase of our existence. I mean, you can go back before we'd made political breakthroughs, economic breakthroughs, and technological breakthroughs, you know, to a society where people had to spend, you know, 95% of their time in brutal manual labor just trying to survive, you know, back in the days when you had to spend your whole time hunting mastodons or something like that, <laughs> you know, or just an earlier form of agricultural society where you had back-breaking manual labor just to feed your family, and so on. There, there wasn't a whole lot of time to cherish you know, these kinds of breakthroughs. There wasn't a, a lot of capacity to actually nourish it with the right kind of education and so on. But certainly in our society today, where we have the technology, we have the economic organization, we have the forms of government which can give people the, the kind of life which includes leisure time and so on to develop and cherish these capacities in children. You know, the only reason it's not there is because you've got a very evil oligarchy out there which hates this conception of man and is out there trying to beat it out of us. Because this, this is the, the, oh, the, the world of noatos, the world of the mind, that is the natural condition of mankind. Yeah. Um, there seems to be... Uh, a lot more going on in the first few so-called books of the Republic than just what you said as far as the uh, negation of, of mm -hmm. the wrong way of looking at this. Uh, I seem to recall LaRouche saying in the papers a few years ago that there was a profound concept uh, that 
he found reminiscent of 1 Corinthians 13 in book 2. Right. Uh, do you know what he's referring to? Yeah, he's talking about the initial statement, which sort of launches the whole discussion, which goes through hypothesis and higher hypothesis. But it's the initial statement when he's in, he's in, his, when he's in the argument with uh, Thrasymachus over the nature of justice. And Thrasymachus is saying, as we know, justice is, you know, who's got the power to implement justice for their own benefit and so on. And uh, Socrates is discussing at that point not so much with Thrasymachus, but with Glaucon and Adamantus. He says, no, I think justice falls in a very special quality category. He says, I think justice falls in the category of those things we love for themselves. And this is one of the very few times in Plato that he actually uses the term agape, the Corinthians idea of love of these kind of universal principles. And what's actually interesting in the Republic, we noticed this the last time we were reading it through, we kind of caught it at a certain point, and it would be useful to go back through and see how deliberate this is. Uh, there's three common words for love in Greek. Uh, there's the first one, which is eros, from which we get erotic. Uh, and it's not just, you know, physical love for another person of an erotic nature. It's, it's love for any object. It's, it's the ultimate love of sense perception. That's what eros is. And throughout the discussion of um, women and children and, you know, bonding and community and all this kind of stuff, He's talking about love, and it's always eros in that section. Then there's, he occasionally then uses the other concept, which is pilos, which is like brotherly love. Um, you know, Philadelphia, city of brotherly love, and so on. Uh, you from there? No. <laughs> you know someone from there? <laughs> uh, philosophy, right? Love of wisdom. Uh, he uses... Uh, love of learning, uh, philomatos. I mean, it's a very common phrase. It's, it's obviously not object love. It's, it's, a, it's a, a higher quality of love. And very, very seldom does he use agape in all of the dialogues. I mean, I've looked. <laughs> um, and, but he uses it. And in, in a sense, it's the, it's the initial statement of the actual theme of the Republic as he identifies it in Book 2. Uh, and then they, they examine, all right, you say this is something you love in and of itself, what is justice? And as often is the case with all of his dialogues, you think you're talking about justice, and you discover what you're actually talking about is how do you know the universe and how do you know good? Uh, you know, I've often wondered if it's at all coincidental that the word for good and the word mm -hmm. and agape are very, very similar in Greek because good is agatos and the, the agapic love is agape. Um, one of the only other times, he, 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 he uses agape about halfway through the laws where he does the same thing he does in the Republic. He goes through a very elaborate discussion of how you divide up the land and who gets this and who gets that and so on, who, who, what the laws are and how you punish people for stealing and murder and sleeping with their mothers and, you know, <laughs> all of this kind of stuff. Um, you know, and then he stops and he says, but wait a minute, we forgot the prelude. We forgot the preamble of our Constitution. And it's in that context he introduces agape again at that point. And then one of the only other places I know he uses it is in the, in the Philebus. Um, where he goes through, which is also a very complex domain type dialogue, um, but there's a certain point where he's developed a very powerful concept, taking through various layers and so on, and he says, if we do this, we will then be living the most agopic life. And the English translation I had translated it as adorable. <laughs> Yet another reason to study Greek. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's, it is this idea of justice for the sake of the, 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 the power of this idea for humanity. And then you really do have to look at the rest of the Republic of the un, as the unfolding of that idea. <laughs>
Anything else? Any, you want Phil back? Any questions on the political situation? I want someone to come back and tell me what the, how the nuptial number works. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I have one thing. Yeah. Um, tomorrow, we're going to have a route. UCLA opens. Um, so it's about twenty to 25,000 people. 40. Okay. <laughs> There's about 40,000 people. That's not my number, though. Um, yeah. <laughs> all in one campus. It's a one. It's a one. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so we're all gonna we're all gonna hit it. So all of the contacts, people who are brand new, it doesn't matter. If you want to spend the night or if you want to meet up with us tomorrow morning, um, we're gonna head out there. And people should just think of good chance, uh, make good posters, and um, and we'll just have full instructions tomorrow morning. How about the office all. crowd? Are they coming with? Yeah, if the office crowd wants to come, they should come. What time? Oh. Gotcha. Seven thirty. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>